Uh, go ahead and take your Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter 6, if you would. And uh, appreciate everybody being here, I really do. And uh, appreciate everybody that is uh, helping out with our homecoming details. There's a lot of work that goes into that, a lot of work. And um, so just, uh, and there's, prob there's probably a lot more work to do too, especially if God keeps changing my messages. So uh, y'all pray for me uh, that I'll be on the right track. We'll bring honor and glory to the Lord and be a blessing to his people. Those of you living no matter where you live, we invite you to come here to Festus, Missouri. Uh, you can find it on a map. It's there. I looked it up. But uh, come be with us next Friday night, all day Saturday, Sunday morning, and then you won't see me the next week. Amen. Amen. But uh, yeah, we look forward to it. We've always had a good time. Co COVID kind of hit us a little bit, but we still had some people th that year too. And um, so we're trying to bounce back from that and people are uh, getting to where they're traveling again and so on. And that's good. And we look forward to having everybody here with us. Ephesians chapter uh, 2, Ephesians chapter 6 is what I was looking for. But yeah, let's go to Ephesians 6 first. And... Um, let me read around Ephesians uh, 6. The Bible says, walk circumspectly. Circum means a circle. Spect is what we wear on our nose, spectacles. That means don't just, if somebody gives you a verse out of the Bible, and they're trying to give you some kind of false doctrine, Go to the verse in the Bible, read what's around that verse. You might find out that they might have taken that direct way out of context and that they're lying through their teeth to you. Is that possible? That men could lie to us and we would end up believing it? It is possible. So Ephesians chapter 6, uh, let's pick it up in um, verse 10. And I want to read down uh, a little bit here. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And I'm telling you, if it's not the Lord, it's not strength. It ain't. But it is, if it is of the Lord, it will be strength. I promise you. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And I want you to, I've, again, I'm re-preaching some things I've preached over the years, but I'm going to point certain things out again. He tells us to stand. What is it that God gave us the ability to do that he did not give dogs, cats, worms, anything like that? The ability to stand on two feet. We're bipedal creatures. We walk on two feet. God has given us the ability. Now, monkeys can walk around for a little bit on two legs, but not very long. Gorillas can do it. Bears can do it. Dogs can do it. Uh, cats can kind of do it. But people are designed to stand. And there's one thing that we learn from the Bible in Genesis chapter 9 that God placed or put in place after the flood. He said to all the beasts, all the animals of the earth that God put it in their heart to have a fear and dread of man. If an animal lives, I mean, way up in the Canadian wilderness and has never seen a human being before, his first sight of a human being standing there, instantly Fear is in that beast's heart and he will flee. Even bears, mountain lions, cougars, you name it, even animals that tend to go on to attack or are predatory in nature, upon seeing a man, their first impulse, their first nature, according to the Bible, is fear. So when Jesus said, or when the Bible said, resist the devil and he will flee from you, it means exactly that. The devil is a beast. 
He is a dragon. He's a serpent. He has a beast nature about him. He cannot overcome that nature, that, that which God has put into him and built into him. He cannot overcome that. And if you stand long enough, he will flee. And the whole thing that the Apostle Paul is trying to teach us here is not how fast we can swing our sword. It's not how accurate we can aim our arrows. It is how long can we stand? How long can we stand? That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. By the way, I learned something about that uh, last week, week before last, something like that. And it's really been a blessing to me. So it's kind of opened same, some things up a little bit for me. So verse 13, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to do what? There's that word stand again. Now it's to withstand. In what? The evil day. I believe that a day is coming that God has called the evil day. That day is coming. And I believe that God's people are going to be present here when the evil day occurs. Which is why he told us that we may be able to withstand in the evil day. He didn't say run and flee and hide. He didn't say crawl under a rock. He said stand. When Nebuchadnezzar ordered all of the people in the plain of Dura, that at the sound of the music, that they were to fall and bow before his 60 cubit tall, 6 cubit wide. What does that sound like to you? The image of the beast. 603 score and 6. 60 cubits tall, 6 cubit wide image of a god. When everybody else fell... Who did we find out was on the Lord's side? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And how easy was it to find that out? They were the ones standing when everybody else fell. I would like to be the one standing. When the evil day comes. I would like to be standing on that day. To withstand in the evil day. And having done all, he, he's going to say it again. Stand. Take the stand. Soldiers, take a stand, soldiers. Amen? What is it they said? Only French soldiers know how to run? Bad joke, but... Stand, therefore, he says it again. So what we got here? Verse, from verse 11, we got stand, verse 11 there. Uh, verse 13, withstand, there's another one, that's the second one. Having done all to stand, that's the third one. Fourth one, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Four times he says that, having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now I'm going to point out one thing here that's real easy. In case you say, well, I just don't understand all this, you know, this helmet stuff and all this shields. I just don't understand. It. Let me give you one thing that's real, real simple for you to understand. A helmet of salvation. What that means is if you're not saved, you're not going to be able to stand. See how simple that is? If you've got a helmet of salvation, I promise you, you're going to stand. I promise you. If you're not even saved, but you're just playing games and you're trying to put off uh, this idea that you're right with God and everything's cool between you and God and God lets you do all your little secret sins and it's okay with you and everything's fine and all that nonsense that people try to tell you on the internet or that the devil tries to whisper in your ear. That's all a big fat lie. You can fool yourself into believing that you're right with God and that you're righteous, but the truth of it is you're not. If you do not have the helmet of salvation on, you will fall on that day and there'll be no help for you whatsoever 
We're going to see it here in a little bit if I ever get to the message. We're going to see it here in a little bit that God basically said, I, He said, on that day, you'll have no power to stand against your enemies. None. God will take it away from you. So He says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. How many of you believe you have the sword of the Spirit right there in your hand, right here? Here it is. Somebody say amen. Do we believe there's any mistakes in this Bible? And this is a, this is amen, not one. King James 1611 Bible. It's right in everything it says. If it's not right, if it's wrong one time, the rule of a prophet is if he's wrong one time, you don't have to listen to him. So if the Bible's wrong one time, what does that tell you? You don't have to read it. All right, now. Um, did we pray? Yeah? No? Yeah? Father, just, we ask God your blessing on your word. And Lord, I need your help today. I pray, dear God, that you would stand in my place. And Father, I'll gladly step aside and let you preach to these people this morning. I'll gladly step aside and sit down and let you preach to me this morning. I need a preacher today. God, would you preach to your servant this morning? Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Now, uh, we, we dealt with principalities, and now we're going to deal with powers. In Ephesians 2, he kind of brings them together. And he says, you hath he quickened where, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. And I thought about this. In relation to that, uh, and to that phrase, power of the air. God designed a certain type of creature to be able, basically have dominion over the air. They're called birds, the fowl of the air. They have dominion over the air. They fly overhead over this. At the beginning of World War II, Hermann Goering's Luftwaffe is what made the difference. For Hitler at the beginning of World War II. But near the end, um, American and British bombers and, and planes had shot down so much of Goering's Luftwaffe. And he was, get this, uh, he was so out of it because he was taking 30 morphine tablets a day, every single day. And uh, was not running the Luftwaffe the way he should. And so his Luftwaffe was shot all to pieces. And that's what aided one of, the, one of the things that got the troops on D-Day onto Omaha Beach, Utah Beach, and those other beaches there and allowed them to move in the way they did. It's because at the beginning of World War II, Germany had power over the air. Anytime you have the high ground, you have the advantage. I'll make this real simple. Let's say there, there's a, a, a troop of soldiers and there's a hundred of them and they're down in a pit. And you've got a troop of 20 soldiers standing over the pit. Who's going to win that battle? See how easy that is? Okay, it's like fish in a barrel. Okay, you have the high ground, you've got the, you've got the territory, you can do it. So the devil is in charge of all of the evil spirits... They're often characterized as the fowl of the air in the scriptures. Remember, Babylon in Revelation 18 is the cage and the hold of every unclean and hateful bird and every evil spirit. So the Bible's connecting them for you there. Okay? So, he is the prince of the power of the air. All of these devils that have this high ground over us, they rule over us or they control us by certain means. Now, I got into this uh, last Sunday and, and we got to the time I just dealt with this first part and we moved on. But let me go through this list again. These are some of the things, some of the ways that Satan will hold power over people in general. But also, don't don't let anybody convince you that none of these apply to those who are saved and born again or go to church or whatever. Because I guarantee you, the devil will try harder on you 
than he will your lost family members. Who believes that one? Say amen. So number one, this is how Satan and his devils hold power over people. Lust, addictions, drugs, alcohol, fornication, pornography. We were talking in Sunday school about this movie that's out. I have not seen it. But basically, it exposes a major pedophile pipeline that exists around the world that is stealing children or breeding them for one purpose. That is to molest them, to sell them, to use them. And at some point, you, listen, I'm, I can, I'm, I'm going to show it. I'm probably going to deal with it this weekend. I'm going to show you from the Bible that yes, they are consuming their blood. Why did God put it in the law for us not to drink blood? Okay? There's more than one reason, I believe. And Babylon knows how to make people drunk off of blood. Isn't it sick? But she knows how to do it. The recipe's out there, and uh, there's no doubt in my mind that very high-placed people and high-placed organizations participate in this. No doubt in my mind. Then we get into evil communications. Because the devil, does the devil have influence through the things that people read? Used to be, you'd walk into a restaurant or a coffee shop and everybody would be sitting around with what? A newspaper. Well, we don't do that anymore. We read online news. And that is all controlled. Evil communications. The power, here's what devils have, the power of persuasion. How many of you believe that? They can talk you into stuff that maybe you don't want to do. That they can talk you into it. They can change your mindset. And what you used to think about this or this issue or that issue, they have the power to change your mindset to a different mindset. Okay? And if you would have, if you would have asked preachers in the 1950s in this country, do you foresee a time when church pastors would be marrying sodomites in their churches, they would say, no, there's no way that'll happen. It's happening. It's happening. How did that happen? Power of persuasion through music. How many of you believe that? Say amen. Music, music, music. Do not let your kids listen to that music, that ungodly, that wicked, that nasty, vile, filthy music. That's out there. I mean, I don't, I don't just don't surf the radio stations anymore looking for something to listen to. And I got an earful one time back uh, a couple years ago. I was taking Matthew and Caleb. We were going to high school basketball games there locally. And uh, in between the periods, they would play the whatever was current music over the intercom there to get the crowd with them. And I'm listening to the words to this music. And they're playing explicit lyrics in a high school for 14, 15, 13 year old kids listening to this stuff. And the public school did it. That's evil communications through music. The devil knows how to use music and to persuade people through music. Amen. Uh, one of the most convincing elements of any film will be the score that's written for that film. You can make a good movie and have a lousy uh, soundtrack for it, and the movie will be a flop. You get somebody who knows what they're doing and how to use music to go along with the film to build whatever emotion they're trying to build. Buddy, you got your one. This, you're going to win awards. You're going to get people to go see it over and over and over again. Music is a powerful, powerful medium. The Bible says in Ezekiel 28 concerning Satan, Lucifer, the devil, the dragon, that the... the Anointed cherub that covereth the workmanship of thy tabrets, like uh, percussion instruments, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes, 
like trumpets, clarinets, organs, things like that. The workmanship, the uh, tabrets and the thy pipes was prepared in the end of the day that that was created. Satan literally had musical instruments built into him. And if you think that's strange, go outside and listen to see if you can hear any animals out there singing music. They do, don't they? Crickets play violins. Music is powerful. Books. When on Sweetie Pie Day, when I take my wife shopping, we go to these big box stores, I go to the book section. I want to see what people are reading out there. And I want to tell you something. They are promoting false religions, occult religion, occult philosophies, Satan's philosophies. They are promoting us through books. Graphic novels. We used to call them comic books. They're not comic books anymore. They're graphic novels. Now they make movies out of graphic novels. And this is a multi-billion dollar industry that's going on. And you have, listen to this, you have grown-ups that go to these comic con conventions and they dress up like it's like they're going on to Halloween and they're six years old and they got a Darth Vader costume look at me I got a Darth Vader costume and they show up at these stupid things dressed like people out of comic books how stupid is that but it tells you the power of persuasion that these people have Graphic novels, movies, TV shows, social media, news outlets. And I have up here light, left wing and right wing. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 33. While I get my bottle of water. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Somebody read that. Somebody, somebody who get, gets to that, stand up and read that for everybody. What does it say? Go ahead, I'll let you go. Go ahead. Go ahead. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Thank you very much. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. We raise our children in Sunday school and in church. We send them to public schools. And it can be done that you can still teach your children the faith that they need to get through life. Even if they are going to public school, it can be done. The problem is then when they get into college... That's where the socialist, Marxist programming really kicks in. And I mean, it kicks in hard. One of my best friends, Megan, we, when I, my first year at Twin City Christian Academy, me and this guy, we hit it off. We were buddies. We both ended up going over to Festus. We graduated the same year. We... Um, we went to his mom put on a graduation party for just a few of his friends I was one of them and there wasn't a bunch we didn't get drunk we didn't wake up in some hotel room with some other person or whatever it was just good it was just families just having a good time and this this young this this friend of mine went to Second Baptist his mom and dad were very uh, involved over there believed the Word of God believed the Bible I could have swore he did and I hooked up with him after our first semester in college. And he had already changed, he had changed, he had started wearing these little John Lennon glasses and little bitty ones like that. Now I'm not saying that's some kind of sin, it's just I saw a change in him immediately. He was not who he was when we parted companies during the summer. And then he, we were talking on the phone, I think, into his second semester. And he said, he said to me, he said, I just got to a point. He said, Mike, I'm going to be honest with you. He said, I don't even believe God exists anymore. He, you know what it was? He started taking a philosophy course. 
didn't believe God anymore. Do you think, do you think that powers had any influence in his life and in his thinking? Sure it did. He, he ended up, he's now a geologist for the state of Arkansas, and I, I almost guarantee you now he believes in evolution. But that's the power that these entities, these devils, they control. They control the press, they control what's on the internet, they control what you see. Now we're getting into the age of artificial intelligence, I'll get to that in a moment. But let me deal with, they, these have control over those who are already in power. You think anybody who is an elected official, there may be some who go in thinking they're really going to make a good, strong change for America, good, strong change for, uh, for what's right and wrong, but I guarantee you they get compromised very, very quickly. Gifts and bribes handed out and records are kept of those and it's used for blackmail and they will use it. Politicians, bureaucrats, bribed, gifted, the super rich, Satanists, occult practitioners. And this, this all sounds crazy, right? Oh, that surely, that don't happen. Oh, yes, it does. And I get, listen, I haven't seen this movie come out yet, and I will. But I think I already know what's in it. I think that it's going to reveal and has revealed and is revealing a network of very rich, very powerful, politically connected people all over the world that are, that are controlled by devils so much that they drink human blood. Crazy. I know I'm nuts, right? But not for that reason. Okay? This is Bible stuff here. Now, technology, artificial intelligence, Taking over everything that we do. Right now, it's our servant. Pretty soon, it will be our equal. Next, it will be our God. It will be our master. We will be doing what it tells us to do, not the other way around. Technology, artificial intelligence, the internet, techno technological advancements in humans. Mingling technology with human beings we now have the ability for the mind and the neural net that Elon Musk company is developing so that the mind will be will have access to the world wide web will have access to the internet and we won't need to repair broken spinal cords any longer we'll just bypass them with our technology and at some point then, it will make men not just equal or those who are handicapped or those who are disabled. It will not make them equal with others. It will make them superior than others. Or if I just read too many comic books. I'm telling you what I think is going on. I'm telling you what I think the devil enticed Eve into in the Garden of Eden was, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then ye eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Imagine, if you will, a network of people with power who now have been given either through technology or genetic manipulation, God-like Powers, superior powers over people. You will not be able to resist their powers. You will be the people who are saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And these things are going to be, they're advancing every day. Human genetic manipulation. I've got whole deals on that. Some of you have seen my videos. God is the one who wrote your DNA. You ought to let God, let, leave it alone. Don't let anybody change your DNA. Somebody say amen. But these are, this is Satan's power over people. And right now, what, what gets me is, you've got some people in this country that still got a little bit of common sense that would say, I'm not going for this stuff. But we remember, we've got younger generations coming up by the millions who have been fed a constant diet of superheroes and gods and devils and dungeons and dragons and how we can, how normal, how did Peter Parker turn into Spider-Man? 
It's okay, I, I knew it. I knew, how, I knew how it happened. Genetic manipulation. He got turned into a god. He's got powers that you don't have. And I'm telling you, this stuff is real. And there is an evil day coming. Will you be able to take a stand on that day or not? Now, let me explain a little bit about, in, in a, turn to Romans 13. In a general sense, what, how powers can be understood. By the way, if you come to our church, you look out here, you'll see the American flag, which we believe in. You, I, I, I'm definitely not going to hang a Chinese flag out there, Amen. My Uncle Harry, 96-year-old, when he passed away two weeks before, he was out mowing his grass. You know why? Because he was a Marine. Amen! World War II Marine. Fought over there on those Japanese islands. He knew what it was like to fight a man's war. He knew what it was like to win a battle. He knew what it was like to take a hill. He knew what it was like to lose his buddies, his best friends in the whole world with their blood and guts laying all over the place. He knew all about that. Okay? So, he fought for a nation that in his lifetime, he saw the decline and the decay of that same nation. He fought... And his buddies died and spilled their blood for a nation that would eventually take the life of one of his grandsons to his fourth drug overdose. That's what he had to endure. He told me a story one time that he was out at uh, that lock and dam, Mom, that we always went fishing at. Said he was driving out there one day and he said there was a guy, there was a car sitting out there. And the guy had left the car running, the door was open, and the guy was sitting in the car, and he said it just still had the needle sticking in his arm. He was alive, but he said, that just made me sick. And he was lost, and he understood it. You'll see also the Christian flag. We believe we are Christians, amen? We're not Muslims, and we're not Chrisloms. There is one way, Jesus Christ is the one way, and we don't apologize for that. But we also understand that there are higher powers over us, and that thin blue line out there on that police flag represents the fact that we believe that man must be governed even at the tip of a sword. Why do you think they want to defund the police? It's not for what they say on the news. They want to take their power away so that nobody will be able to fight the army that they're building behind the scenes. That guy Carter, he's crazy. Get him. We got to get out of this place. He's nuts. Yes, I am. Romans 13, verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Do you believe that a man wearing a badge has power over you? You better believe he does. So much so that we as the people of the state of Missouri have made sure that all lawmakers pass laws that ensure that every police officer out there, whether they're state troopers, county deputies, city police, they're all carrying deadly weapons. And we give them the right in certain situations to use those weapons if necessary now if you can't handle that I'm sorry but some people are just begging to be shot okay let every soul be subject unto the higher powers for there's no power but of God do you believe that the powers that be are ordained of God see he said it again do you, now, do you still believe it? Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist 
shall receive to themselves what? Damnation. That ought to be a title of a sermon I'll preach one of these days. A little hyphen in there, conveniently placed. <laughs> Damnation. Because Sister Pam finally got it. <laughs> and I could have said Yankees in there, but I said, yeah, okay. But that's what, that's what we're turning into, is a nation that is doomed to be damned if we do not have order and control. In the absence of order, what do you have? That's what they want. So he says, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Would thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. When I am in the gas station in the morning, I see one of them guys in uniform. I'd be sure to tell them, thank you for your service. And I'm talking to the cops. And then I tell them, you know my sister, Melissa? Yeah! Oh, she's so sweet. Ask her how many times she beat me up. I do. I do that. I do. You know, those, you know I, first, the first time I ever said that to a law enforcement officer, we were traveling, some, I think we were going to Indiana, and I said that to a female cop, uh, I think it was in Illinois, might have been, and we were at a gas station, a truck stop, and I was in there getting a soda, we was filling up gas, and I saw her in there, and I said, ma'am, I just want, you know, you don't approach them and st stick your hand out to a cop, don't do that to a cop, that makes them nervous, okay? But I just kind of stood my ground. I said, ma'am, I just want to tell you, thank you for your service. And she was like, she said, thank you for saying that. That's probably the first time anybody has ever said to her, thank you. For putting on a uniform and wearing a badge. Um, verse 4, look at this. This is what God says about police officers. He is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. That means what good does it do to give him a sword, but then give him orders to never use it? That's ridiculous, isn't it? Bill Clinton sending, what was that? What was that? Sent our troops over to Kosovo. Remember something like that? Sent them over there. Told them carry guns, but don't give them any bullets now. We don't want that. He beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Now, what you're seeing here is you're understanding powers. Powers will always have the ability to enforce whatever whosever side they're on, they will have the ability to enforce what it is they're trying to do, or they are no power. So if we take the guns away from the cops, from the police officers, from the deputies, from the, from the officers, from the whoever, if we take their guns away from them, then they are no power. They are no power. And that's what people want. That's what some people want. They don't want to just defund them. Let's get their good. And by the way, yours are next. In fact, yours are first. Take your guns away. Because they will, in taking your weapons away, they will take your power away. By the way, here's the weapon. Amen? Is this not the shield of faith? Is this not the sword of the Spirit? Is this not the helmet of salvation? Is this not our loins girded about with truth? Is this not the gospel of Jesus Christ? Take this away and we have no power whatsoever. Let me, let me read. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Genesis 31, 29. I like this one. Uh... This was Laban, you don't have to turn there, but very quickly, Laban 
had um, Isaac, Jake, Jacob, and this is where Jacob married Rachel and Leah and Bill and Zilpah and all them and, and was having all those kids, and he finally left, and somebody among uh, Jacob's lot, Jacob didn't know uh, who it was, but it ended up being Rachel, we find that out in the Bible, but her father Laban came running after Jacob and all of his family because somebody he knew somebody had taken his gods that he worshipped, his idols, his statues. And he came to him and he said, It is in the power of my hand to do you hurt. Because Laban just, didn't just come by himself. He brought his army with him. Meet the army. He brought his army with him. He brought his servants with him. All of them carrying swords. And he said, if I find out who's got my idols, I'm going to kill them. And he said, do you not know that it is in the power of my hand to do you hurt? But the God of your father spake unto me yesterday night, saying, take thou heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. In other words, God restricted it, didn't he? So who's got more power? God does. Now, Leviticus 26. Leviticus 26 is one of those chapters that is just chock full of you better believe what God said. It's just like Deuteronomy 28. And there are, there are varying accounts of George Washington's inauguration. And I haven't really determined which inauguration it was but there's some that I've read that said when George Washington took his oath of office he didn't just put his hand on the Bible he put it on Deuteronomy 28 he opened it up because Deuteronomy 28 was God's covenant with the nation the people as a nation but anyway in Leviticus 26 he said and they shall fall one upon another as it were before a sword when none pursueth, and ye shall have no power to stand before your enemies. And this is where I wanted to go this morning. And I'm not going to carry this too far. But I want you to ask yourself the question. When your enemies, and we're not talking about the neighbor that lives across the street who keeps kicking over your trash can we're talking about your lusts your sins your transgressions the evil that you are prone to do those are your enemies do you have the power to tell your enemies, no. No. You're not getting me today. You're not getting my family. You're not getting my wife. You're not getting my kids. I'm telling you, no. See, when you read Leviticus 26, if you will follow what God said and do what God said and believe what God said, God said, I'll give you power to stand against all your enemies. But he said, if you won't do what I tell you to do, if you won't believe my judgments, my statutes, my commandments, then every time they come barging in, you're going to bow before them. And you're going to do what they tell you to do. And you have to ask yourself the question, if that's how it is, am I saved? If you have absolutely no power to stand I, I, in fact I'll give you an example Saul King Saul because Saul rejected God's word did Saul have the power in that battle that he fought the next day 
Did he have power to stand against his enemies? No. In fact, God had taken all the power away from him, so much so that he fell upon his own sword and took his own life. That's how much power God had taken away from him. He didn't even have the power to preserve his own life. God took it from him. Okay? The night before, he was consulting with a witch. The night before, he was talking with a devil, a familiar spirit. And God took his power away from him to be able to withstand his enemies. Just one time, just one time. Ask God to give you the power one day to say no. No. And I promise you, the end of that day, you'll look back and you'll say, that was awesome. God, give me some more of that. And he will. If you'll follow what he said. But if you won't, you'll have no power. I'm going to see what else I have here. I don't have much else. Next. uh, Yeah. Yes, sir. Is it really? The life, the, the blood thereof, the, it's the life. Yep. They got that from me. No, I'm just kidding. So next Sunday morning, we're going to get into the darkness. Okay? So bring a light with you. Okay? Let's stand to our feet.